popular swimming pool in the beach is closed again this summer. How often do you use this pool here? Uh, pretty often pretty in often. the summer, yeah. Why construction and renos have shuttered a beloved swimming spot for a second year in a row. They've been very aloof. They just keep saying soon. Plus, the patio problem in Toronto hits the mayoral campaign trail with businesses denied or delayed. We take the cost of reimbursement to the Cafe TO program directly to candidates running for mayor. I am thrilled to see the infrastructure planning contract go ahead. And expanding train service in the eastern part of the GTA, how much time the Bowmanville GO expansion will save commuters and how much money it is slated to cost. Hey, thanks for joining us. I'm Chris Glover. Warm, summery weather has the city busy getting its outdoor pools ready for the season. But for the second straight year, residents in the beach won't be able to use theirs. The city announcing Donald D. Somerville Olympic Pool would be closed for even more repairs. As Patrick Swadden explains, residents are disappointed, but happy the neighborhood staple will live on. This is an icon, a beach icon. Carm Nuno has endless memories of coming to Donald D. Somerville Olympic Pool as a kid. Memories these two are making now. How often do you use this pool here? Uh, pretty often pretty in often. the summer, yeah. It's like swimming with almost friends. every week. It's a lot of fun in the summer. But that fun will have to wait until at least next summer. The city announcing today the pool will remain closed for the 2023 season. City Director of Capital Projects Jesse Gressley Jones saying it's a unique and well loved facility, but. It was built in 1962 and it's undergoing pretty significant repairs to make sure that it can be. Uh, rejuvenated to a state that it'll be used for many years to come. Repairs that started last year, causing the 2022 season to also be cancelled. The city expedited work and did get the 25 meter open by late July, but couldn't get the 50 meter open by summer's end. And during this spring's window for repairs, the city discovered the repair is more significant. And that forced the Toronto Summer Swim Camp, a club for five to 18 year olds, to settle at Monarch Park Outdoor Pool. The biggest drawback is that it's, um, it can house about half the amount of swimmers. So it means that I won't be able to be, I won't be able to have a full capacity summer and, and, and we'll have to put caps on it probably starting tomorrow. But Hayes is excited for a 2024 reopen and residents nearby say, no half measures. I get it done. You know, that's the way I see it. Kind of like road work. Let's just get it done. You know, if you're going to do it, shut it down and then let's do it properly. Properly meaning relining the Olympic and dive pools, as well as replacing the entire pool deck, says the city, a cost of $3.5 million. So where are people going in the meantime? Plenty of pools in Toronto, I guess. Where do you think you'll go now that, uh, you know, this facility is closed? Mm, maybe the lake, honestly, it's the next best thing. I guess the it's beach. Close enough. And the good news is the city says it's mostly resolved its lifeguard staffing issues from last summer. They're now on duty seven days a week in designated swim areas. So if you're missing that pool and you feel like taking a dip, try one here. Just remember to bring a better set of clothes. Patrick Swadden, CBC News, Toronto. All right, so with the right outfit, the beach is a lot of fun. Pools are revving up use. Same with patios as well. But tonight, more problems are facing the popular Cafe TO program. And today, those issues landed on the mayoral campaign trail. Ali Shiasan has the latest on that. In Toronto, people love their patios. But what's also true about this city is all the red tape involved in getting things done. And this year's Cafe TO rollout is an unfortunate example of that. It's hurry up, get your permit in, wait, wait, wait. Hurry up, pay the fees, sign these forms, wait, wait, wait. And now we've got the infrastructure in, we've got the, the bollards in, we've got the big concrete blocks in the street, and yet we're still not allowed to use it. It's the middle of June. Any idea when La Palette's Queen Street patio will be approved? They've been very aloof. They just keep saying soon. La Palette owner Shamez Amlani says candidates would be wise to make it an election issue. Good coffee. Here. <laughs> and so he's hosting Olivia Chow for a cup of coffee and a campaign stop. What about this year when the small businesses get everything ready and they've lost a lot of weekends in the part of the summer already, right? 
should they have a refund? That's worth considering. Her opponent, Anna Bailau, said she would for sure get their money back. As mayor, we'll definitely reverse that, the fees for this year and ensure that next year we have a program that is properly rolled out. And Mark Saunders? As mayor, I will cut the red tape. I understand the importance. And Brad Bradford, what say you? It's time for less talk and more action. Let's go to City Hall, where several councillors, including Bradford, vouched for some rejected patios in their wards. On favour, carry. With that, six businesses had their patio denials reversed, including two in Bradford's ward, such as Bud's Coffee. For everyone else, Councillor Paula Fletcher has a motion to overhaul the current cafe TO system, which has yet to be debated. But in the wake of delays and appeals, just how much of patio season is salvageable? Chow put it this way. Let's do it before it gets cold, <laughs> because, you know, summer is not very long here in Toronto. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Summer is not long, but it's just kicking off. 16 degrees and mostly cloudy tonight with a decent chance of rain and even thunderstorms. Johanna Wagstaff joining us now with a first look at the weather forecast. And Joe, it looks pretty pleasant out there, but it's been a busy night in the weather department, hey? Yeah, Chris, an active evening across much of southwestern Ontario with those storms rolling across the border pretty much since the dinner hour. Let me show you the big picture. Uh, we didn't waste much time from that departing low yesterday to the one uh, rolling across Michigan bringing uh, hundreds of lightning strikes as well as severe watches and warnings. Still not out of the question to see some stray storms in the next few hours. So do head indoors, uh, take cover if you are out late. These storms do have a history of producing uh, severe conditions. Things are looking much more calm in the long range forecast. We've got showers through tomorrow morning, just a slight risk on the back end of that system. Lows down around 15 by the time we're up and at them around 8 a.m. I think we'll already see those high teen temperatures and a good break uh, between systems for uh, the GTA. But it's tomorrow evening. Uh, the back end of that low makes a reappearance. So showers returning uh, to the shores of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. A much heavier rain in the forecast for eastern Ontario. So I'll time that out uh, a little bit later on in the show. Back to you, Chris. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Johanna. Just weeks after the city said it would begin referring refugee claimants seeking beds in its shelter system to federal asylums, asylum seekers who recently arrived in Canada are still struggling to find places to sleep. These people we have been seeing that they are staying outside on the street at the drop-in centers. And the problem is that they don't have beds because there is not enough uh, budget for the city to accommodate them. Three city shelters for refugees, which is not enough beds. So the city says it needs more financial support from the federal government to handle increasing demand for emergency shelter by residents and refugees. In the meantime, dozens of asylum seekers are stuck in limbo. Last month, Deputy Mayor Jennifer McKelvey said the city's approximately 9,000 bed shelter system was at capacity nightly and it could no longer cope with the high number of refugee claimants hoping to access a bed. The city says the federal government has failed to provide Toronto with funding this year to help cover the cost of housing new arrivals, funding it has provided in recent years. Federal Immigration Minister Sean Fraser telling CBC News today his department is engaged in talks with the City of Toronto on finding a solution and more details could be coming in the days ahead. The province's police watchdog is looking into the death of a 58-year-old man who fell from the window of a downtown hotel early this morning. Police were on scene at the time, but it's unclear how much they'd interacted with the man before he fell. Greg Ross has all, all the details. I mean, I really couldn't believe it because it, it, it just was unreal. This woman was a guest at the Holiday Inn Express near Jarvis and Richmond last night. She heard the commotion just before 3 o'clock this morning. It sounded like he, almost like he was moving furniture, like he was dropping the refrigerator and stuff. And then you heard the window open, the window break, and he's just screaming his you know, head off. Police were called after reports of a man throwing items from this fourth floor window to the street below. And then the police got here, and they were downstairs, and they came upstairs. Um, and I don't know exactly what happened, but the next thing you heard was thump. 
According to police, officers on scene attempted to communicate with the man. A short time later, he somehow fell out of the window. The SIU has now been called in to investigate because police were on scene and communicating with the person before they fell from the window. At this point, it appears the only interaction police had with the man was through the hotel room door. The information I have at this time is that when the man fell to the street, um, police were outside of, the, uh, outside of the hotel room. The police were called at 2.55 this morning. Paramedics were called just 13 minutes later, which appears to be after the man fell. The information that the SIU has at this time is that the man was pronounced deceased at the scene. Police have not released the man's identity. The SIU is interviewing witnesses to get a clearer picture of what happened. They're also hoping to get results of a post-mortem examination as early as tomorrow. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. A terrible national story to tell you about tonight. The Prime Minister has expressed condolences this evening for the 15 people killed on a highway in southwestern Manitoba. Another 10 people were injured after a semi-trailer and bus carrying seniors collided on the Trans-Canada Highway west of Winnipeg. New tonight, Premier Ford releasing a statement expressing his incredible sadness for the tragic collision. Cameron McIntosh has the latest on what happened. Seniors on a casino trip, their bus completely destroyed after colliding with this truck in this intersection on the Trans-Canada Highway just north of Carberry, Manitoba, about two hours west of Winnipeg. Witnesses describe a horrible scene. Only death on this scale is never, never normalized for us. RCMP found bodies strewn about and 10 people injured. Forensic experts are still trying to figure out who the victims are as accident reconstructionists begin the meticulous task of sorting out what actually happened. Answers will take some time, but I can assure you that the RCMP will get the answers. Known so far, a minibus carrying 25 people left Dauphin about two hours north for a trip to a casino in Carberry. The bus crossed two westbound lanes at an intersection of a divided stretch of the Trans-Canada, then collided with the truck headed east. Both drivers survived. The 10 injured were taken to hospitals, including four airlifts to Winnipeg, where Manitoba's largest hospital was put on code orange, focusing all available resources on the accident. And we are continuing to triage and move them where they need to be. Most of the injuries were head injuries or orthopedic in nature, and we'll continue to assess as we go. Our hearts are broken and our thoughts are with the families and loved ones of all the lives impacted by the horrific and devastating tragedy near Carberry. It's also very similar to the crash in Humboldt. RCMP say experts from that investigation will help in this one. They are treating this as a potential crime scene. We need to be alive to the fact that there could be wrongdoing. And if so, there could be a criminal element to this investigation. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News. Welcome back. The Ontario government says it is one step closer to extending GO train service further into Durham region. The Premier announcing today that his government has awarded a contract to a Bowmanville construction company. As Talia Ricci reports, it is one of many GO projects underway, but riders are also eager to see better service in the short term. The plan to extend the Lakeshore East Line almost 20 kilometres into the town of Bowmanville has been in the works for a while. But today the province says they're closer to getting shovels in the ground. Today we're announcing that we have awarded Bowmanville Construction Partners a contract for advanced infrastructure planning on the Bowmanville GO extension. I am thrilled to see the infrastructure planning contract go ahead so that we can finally connect our community to the rest of the GTA through GO Transit. The extension will bring four new GO stations into the region. Once completed, the province says it will reduce average travel time from Bowmanville to Union Station by 15 minutes. It will include new signals, bridges and is projected to carry nearly 17,000 daily trips by 2041. Over the next 10 years, we will invest over $70 billion to build a modern, integrated and rapid public transit network across the Greater Golden Horseshoe. This is part of a massive GO expansion happening over the next several years, which will include more frequent all-day service, faster trains, more trains and work being done here, improving Union Station. It's 
going to be the biggest transit project on the whole in the next 10 years. There's a ton of new stations being built. So there's these smart track stations in Toronto, which are kind of new urban go stations. That's really huge because places like Liberty Village and uh, St. Clair Old Weston, those are areas that don't have rapid transit access right now. Yes, there are works going on like the Lakeshore, uh, the uh, the line to Kitchener, the line to Barrie particularly is having a lot of work done on it, some work on the Stouffville line. Um, but there's not that much to show for it yet. They don't pay enough attention to the need for uh, incremental benefits that riders can use today. That's a sentiment riders can get on board with. The GO buses are like, having it only at five in the morning or like late at night is just not convenient. The Kitchener line, they shortened it to six trains on the one that I take early in the morning and it's really crowded. More security on board too. More high frequency trains, uh, especially going out to the west and east in the boroughs. The Bowmanville expansion is also expected to bring thousands of jobs into the region in addition to the faster travel times. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Shifting back to today's Go Press conference because the Premier was asked about a report this week from Ontario's budget watchdog, the Financial Accountability Office, forecasting the province will have $22 billion in excess funds over the next few years. You know, I, I'm going to say this respectfully about the FAO. One second, we aren't spending enough a few months ago. And it's, it's a snapshot in time, not looking at the whole year. And then, and then next thing you know, we have too much money. Here's a bit more background for you. The FAO says the $22 billion represents money that isn't needed to fund existing or announced programs. Now, the NDP is accusing the Ford government of sitting on billions of dollars that could be invested in public services. But the Premier saying today the FAO's financial predictions are wrong 99% of the time. Oh, we just aren't in favor of it. This is up to all the mayors. It's not up to one mayor to go out there and say, you know, you want to build your empire. And that was the premier throwing cold water on the idea of amalgamating the nine municipalities of York region. The proposal is being put forth by Marco Mayor Frank Scarpetti. He believes the move would bring significant savings and streamlined governance. But the premier says Scarpetti is the only one of the York region mayors who wants that to happen. The province is appointing facilitators to assess several regional governments, including York's, it is all part of a plan to expand the strong mayor powers beyond Toronto and Ottawa. This week is National Blood Donor Week, and Canadian Blood Services is putting out the call for people to roll up their sleeves. Tonight, the Plasma Donor Centre in Brampton held an open house to educate people about the importance of donating plasma. So all the plasma that's being donated here is being used for protein-based specialized medication for uh, conditions such as cancer patients, autoimmune disor disorders, neurological disorders, among many others. So we use that to create the specialized medications and provide that for over 700 hospitals across Canada. Blood Services says donor behavior changed over the pandemic and fewer people are donating regularly. The nonprofit is looking to fill over 150,000 open appointments. Johanna Wagstaff is back and the rough weather is back with us for another day, Joe. Yeah, Chris, one more unsettled day across southern Ontario and then we get back into our ridge of high pressure just in time for the weekend. Let me show you a snapshot of the temperatures across the eastern half of the country tomorrow. Still think they're underplaying temperatures. This is just straight model data for Toronto. A uh, little muggier as you move uh, down towards Windsor, feeling probably more like 27, feeling that mugginess in through Montreal, and that's going to come with some rain through southern Quebec and eastern Ontario. Here's how things will play out for the greater Toronto area. Down around the Golden Horseshoe, we're seeing those showers sink south as we speak tonight. Notice that pulse tomorrow morning. Here's a snapshot of tomorrow evening. That system really does uh, pull east in earnest, but then it sort of ends up getting stuck in the atmosphere. So things looking very clear west of Kingston, but as I run this through Saturday, notice we almost get this east to west flow back over Kingston, possibly as far west as Belleville. I think that's as far as the rain will go though, looking to clear right out for the weekend for most of Toronto. As far as rainfall totals, this is really uh, just what we're seeing with what's left of that low. So some isolated pockets uh, down around the shores of Lake Erie, 
mainly that's convective with those uh, thunderstorms we may see in the next few hours, uh, but really a general 10 to 20 millimeters before we clear right out in the long range. Uh, as far as that thunderstorm risk tomorrow, uh, just a chance in the evening, again, as that low swings south of the lower Great Lakes, Seasonal afternoon highs around 24, so we're not quite there tomorrow for Toronto. A little cooler by the water. Uh, by the weekend, ridge of high pressure builds back in. So we're talking sinking air. Watch for winds to shift, and by the end of the weekend into early next week, we may be seeing those winds come from the north. We'll have to keep an eye on air quality. Still looking at those big fires burning uh, in through central Quebec. Okay, so a clear and warm weekend. We'll notice that humidity start to build for early next week. I think it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Thursday, we'll really be feeling the heat. We could be up in a, a humidex around the high 20s. And Chris, I wish I had more rain for us in the long range. And we're dealing with drought conditions, but at least the high pressure has lined up with the weekend. Absolutely. And it'll be nice for Father's Day as well. Thank you, Johanna. Denver threw a big street party today to celebrate their first NBA championship win in Nuggets franchise history. The whole team took part, including their star Kitchener's Jamal Murray. I appreciate everybody. You know what I'm saying? We really did this. Y'all really did this. Y'all give me energy. We give you energy. And we chance for life. Champions for life. Energy for everybody. Swarms of fans showed up to cheer on the team during today's parade, and the Nuggets won the championship title Monday night, beating the Miami Heat in Game 5. And that is our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night, everybody.